call recorded. This is the build OGM call for Tuesday, December 21, 2021, the winter solstice. So we are, and, and we figured out that today at 3.29 PM where we live, it's, uh, is actually the solstice. Uh, we didn't call a scientist, we just asked Google. Um, although it should be pretty good, right? Um, so it's kind of exciting because I'm always happy when the days start getting longer. I'm always sad when we get to the summer solstice and it's like, nope, 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 stop, stop, stop. Well, when to, yes. So uh, what, what is the, the, the classic sentence? Felis dies sol invicti. What is it? So, uh, Felis dies sol invicti. I think I don't have it exactly. Yeah. But happy day of the uh, unvanquished sun. Oh, that's right. That's right. Uh, the Roman uh, Mithraist, uh, the, the, the Mithraist version. I'm sure we can look that up. Sol invictus. Uh, uh, yep. There's uh, the festival of the unconquered sun. I've never heard of this. This is good. Thank you. Uh, here we go. Sol Invictus. It just keeps saying Sol Invictus, but it doesn't give me the full saying. So Felix. Yeah. No, it doesn't say Felix. So Felix Diaz Natalis Solis Invicti. Natalis, okay. Sorry, I had to look for it. I should know this better. <laughs> Oops. Uh, thanks. And it's the beginning of the Saturnalia in classic Rome. There we go. Felix is Natalis Solis in Victor. Huh. Very straight. Um, cool. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the Caulfield article without my having read it? Or should we just skip until some of the time? Because I'm, in I'm interested and I'd love your sort of preview or take. Um. Okay, basically he's making a generic argument and I don't know how much I want to go into details because I'd have to review it a bit myself. Right. That um, we have this basic instinct that given this information, more information is more. And that, you know, people should research all the pros and cons and decide. And he gives a few examples where you know, more information is actually confusing and good heuristics are better than research. Mm -hmm. He gives actually a very good example on uh, choosing a house and, you know, how much should we spend for a house and, uh, you know, calculate uh, incomes and expenses and yada, yada, yada. And he says, basically, this is a good way to get into using bias, oh, oh, I will be able to let go of that expense. No, you won't. <laughs> or mm -hmm. not taking into account this or not taking into account that mm -hmm. because you want to think you have more income than you do. And, you know, there's a rule of thumb, don't spend more than 28% of your gross income on the house. And this is actually <laughs> better heuristics <laughs> mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there's less of that um, using uh, your own uh, uh, your instant own bias, judgment. your own instant judgment, which He's is usually biased. Actually, quoting Gigerenzer, uh, rationality for mortals, uh -huh. um, risks and rules of of thumbs, and he's using uh, he's been pushing this sift method right for uh, quickly knowing the origin of a claim and quickly evaluating a claim by just looking at where does it come from mm -hmm. as opposed to doing all the research about it. And he does show that basically students who spend more time researching kind of the logic of the claim end up like if they do it a little bit, it works really well. And if they do it a lot, they get into information overload and maybe this and maybe that, and it's hard to weigh the relative importance of the various counter arguments and the relative value of the various pro and con arguments. Uh, and that was a very interesting point. Like we get all these, oh yes, but this, but that, but this, but that. And it's like, okay, which ones are just a but that is, you know, somebody said this <laughs> versus, you know, this is research and there's a meta study or whatever, right? Yeah. And, 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 and he's saying, asking people to be 
scientists is totally overkill. And asking people to research more is provably counterproductive. Mm. Finding more arguments mm -hmm. has been shown to be counterproductive, as opposed to the very, very uh, simple step of, okay, where does this come from? Is it, uh, does it show up in reliable sources? Does it right. show up in blah, 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 which has its own flaws, right? I mean, we all know that reliable sources are their own echo chambers and this and that. It's not yeah. that simple, yeah. but he's saying it's a much better heuristic than doing the research and being flooded. From, and, yeah. and certainly I've been, you know, trying to, and me and many people in our circle, we're trying to help people see the whole picture. <laughs> and this notion that seeing the whole picture could be detrimental is definitely something I think we need to address. I don't think it means let's not show the whole picture, uh, but is there a way to contextualize it so that we can help people uh, not be overwhelmed by the multiplicity of pros and cons, which is certainly infinite, right? Right, right. And we and we we select evidence to prove our case. You know, we have yep, a, yep. a whole bunch of biases. Um, what was the SIFT methodology you were just talking about? Uh, he's been setting up a methodology. Okay, let me let me just do a link dump because I think yeah. it's the e easiest thing I can do. Thanks. Uh, so tuk, 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 zoom uh, chat chat. Chat, thank you. There you go. So this oh, is wow. <laughs> this is a link dump. So the, the first link is the, the just the literacy for mortals. The second one is an author note about that thing and why he thought about it. The uh -huh. next one is the lateral reading Canada, Canada Civic Study. That is a big study with tons of schools in Canada where they used his methodology for uh helping people do information literacy. Right. Uh, then so this is, there's this is, this is Caulfield's methodology of SIFT. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. And okay. uh, and uh, webliteracypressbook.com is the uh, kind of little booklet he wrote about the methodology. The the civic study, the Canadian civic study, also has interesting. Like they've got another version of another packaging of it in terms of lessons and uh, you know a, a, a real program around it. Mm -hmm. And then there's articles about uh, by Caulfield as he elaborated this. So you get a bit more of the history. So those would be the last links. So you're, wow. <laughs> this is really my link dump about this. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. And, and super interesting because he's trying really hard to make us smarter uh, yes. by, by stepping carefully through the ways we think we make ourselves smarter and saying, mm, that one, not so much. And try this instead. And how about, a, how about the system you know, to step through things and all of that. It's really, really interesting. Huh, huh. And, and also um, this is a way of fighting the endless recursive unpacking of, of trying to be explicit about everything and trying to map everything and trying to be complete and because that's never ending, right? And this is maybe a way to, I don't know that this is a way to cut your, to, to logic your way through arguments or to find your way to better conclusions it doesn't sound like a reasoning system, but it sounds like a, an evidentiary system. I'm kind of making this up as I think about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm just. Uh, yeah. And I, and I ended up yesterday chasing a little rabbit hole uh, around the Margaret Mead uh, controversy. I didn't realize oh. how, con how controversial she was, but um, so there's this guy, Freeman. Uh, so let me uh, go back to my brain and find the the mean Freeman controversy. Here's uh, here's the um, <clears throat> here's the link in the book Coming of Age in Samoa, which is her first famous work when she was 27 years old. She comes back from Samoa and writes Coming of Age in Samoa, which apparently like motivates feminism and a whole bunch of things because it says, hey, there's young people in Samoa who have sexual freedom and this and that and the other. And then this guy Freeman who worked in Samoa as well says, nope, it's all bullshit. Um, what happened was she got tricked by, by two of her, um, what do you call them? Uh, informants. Informants, thank you, perfect. Which is just the worst word to use for, for that, but still, uh, especially you know, given World War II. Um, but she got tricked by two of her informants who were just pulling her tail uh, uh, and uh, pulling her leg. That's the actual expression. And, it's, it's, it, and then I read this Scientific American article by John Horgan that says, no, 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 forget, forget about Freeman's critique. He was a crazy guy. He was like a loon. 
And, and in fact, Mead was much more subtle about her research and more thoughtful. And if you go look at what she did <clears throat> over time, um, she was you know, really, really good at this. And she put out a couple of fires. There was one point late in her career where a, a different research paper was really controversial and people were like kind of cancel culture-ish about it. And she was like, you know, no, that would be a book burning. Let's not do that. Let's slow down and talk about this. And so, so he defends Margaret. And I'm like, I had no idea this was all happening. Um, yeah. I'm um, very, very interesting. I'd like, I would read more about that specific controversy. And it's not impossible she got that wrong, but I have no doubt that she's one of the smartest women yeah. <laughs> in that age. So here's, here's the Horgan article. I just pasted in. Well, one thing, by the way, I was really, really happy while reading The Dawn of Everything. I'm not done yet. Yeah. But how much he sends us back to the notion of schismogenesis, mm -hmm. which is originally a Bateson, and I think a Bateson need uh, idea, right? I think so. I don't know. I've, I've got it under Bateson only, but that doesn't mean anything. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. It, it, anthropology no developed by Bateson okay so <clears throat> maybe maybe it's Bateson only yeah, yeah and it's interesting I mean uh so Stacy for you uh, Mead and Bateson were married you, I don't know if you know this uh their daughter is Nora Bateson uh and Mary Catherine, and Mary Catherine Bateson and there's another one there's a third one whose name I forget yep uh, uh, and so their their con their sort of collaborations are super interesting, and Bateson is one of these very deep systems thinkers as well. Uh, five kids of Gregory. Now maybe you know he had three spouses, uh -huh. and so did Margaret Mead. <laughs> uh <-huh>. Yeah, <laughs> but they just say five, including it's like. Wow. Uh, they had a son, John Sumner Bateson, as well as twins who died young. Mm. Uh, oh, no, no, but that's the, the Sumner. Uh, okay, so Mary Catherine is the only daughter in common. Oh, interesting. Okay, so Nora is not. <clears throat> yeah. Thank Nora's you. from a different wife. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, third time uh, uh, therapist and social worker, Lois Kamak. Okay. Um, so, so I, li I, I like this thinking about thinking a lot. I think, you know, epistemologically or whatever else logically, I think we're, we're, we're certainly in those waters and trying to figure out how this, how this might work. But it takes me back to last Friday's call uh, about composting and no, how. I, I know, and I want to report on it because it was kind of, it was a lovely warm call, but it was very lukewarm about composting. Um, and, and part of it was the language of composting is not great, but it's not, it's not the metaphor or the, or the label that matters so much. It's like, I, I can kind of, and, and this may only be because I'm obsessively like curating the brain, et cetera, et cetera. But, but I can see how several people would be doing a piece of what you just said together in a shared space and how that would be useful for humanity in some sense by leaving behind artifacts that would be arguments and, and uh, you know, other sorts of narrative trails and whatever else. And, and the more we learn and begin to understand how to feedback into the system, hey, this is just a story or just a narrative, but it's important as a, as a, as a narrative because narratives tend to conquer our brains and eat our souls and take over our, our policies, right? Um, and then here's a string of facts that were disproven later, but were but held sway for it. Like that kind of thing is interesting as well. Um, but I can see that happening. But but I don't know that everybody on the call was like, yeah, yeah, I can see that happening. So it was it was me, uh, Gene Bellinger, uh, Stacy. You were on the call. I forget. Uh, it was just four of us on the call. Um, and I can I can look at the uh, the video again also. Uh, but but we didn't end up at the at, at the end of the call. Uh, I think Mark Carranza was on the call too, um, and he is an obsessive like I am with a particular tool that he's built. Right, so uh, so so both of us can kind of see it. But not, but at the end of the call, we weren't all going, "Yeah, awesome, this is great. We know how to frame it. Let's go do this." So, and that, sorry, 
Let me step can, back. Can you give me the 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 two line ver definition of composting because okay. I'm afraid I'm lost. That's fine. That's fine. Um, so the the conceit of weaving the world is that there are regular episodes that are like the fruiting body, the mushroom of of this thing. They look and smell like regular podcast episodes. Uh, then we have composting calls, that's the temporary name, where we look back on those episodes, invite in the guests from the episodes too, if they can, if they want to or can attend. But then with other people, we sit there and we we go deeper. We're like, okay, like you just sent a, a beautiful batch of links to me. I would weave those into my brain even before the composting call. And then we would sit down and stare at this. And I would go read some call field and make sure that I had done some more homework. And then we, then we would come in and say, what, where does this take us? What else does it connect to? Um, where else might that conversation that we had uh, lead us, right? So the composting is, is kind of mulching, uh, inoculating the, the nutrient materials and putting them into the, the larger ongoing body uh, of useful work. And that assumes a whole bunch of things. That assumes that there is an ongoing body of useful work of some sort other than Wikipedia, let's say, that assume that people collaborating can find their way to the simpler arguments, like you started the conversation about Caulfield and literacy. It assumes a bunch of things like that. But but I can see the pony. Like I'm like, that that smells like important work and like something we can start to prototype and model for other people. And, and one of the devious goals of weaving the world is to get other people excited about composting, right? And about feeding the big fungus, which is why I like the mycelial metaphor so much. So, so it's really about deep dives, and I certainly cannot be more encouraging of deep dives. And yeah. the, 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 the whole, was where I don't know where I was having that conversation, uh, I think with Wendy, actually. Um, Alfred, uh, you remember Clay Shirky? Of course. Uh, saying that one of the conditions of collective intelligence, the way he defined it, was independence, like diversity and independence of the yeah. opinions right. uh, to basically avoiding groupthink, making sure people don't see one another's. And I'm sure that's absolutely true. And I often have the exact opposite, but I think it's not contradictory definition that I don't think there's real collective intelligence if you just aggregate information from everybody's individual position. It's when people start to really build on one another's positions and learn from one another and create something more that you have real collective intelligence. Yeah. But there's no question that that stage of building on one another works best if you've really mapped out the diversity. And there, I think Clay Shirky's independence is perfectly valid. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you need both. And this is the, the, the usual pulsation back and forth. Mm -hmm. And, and the composting stage, I don't know if it's related to that, to be honest, but what it seems to me is that the, the pre-compost stage, it's mm -hmm. more, you know, let's create a curated view in a small group because, sorry, yesterday's conversation on curation mm -hmm. is totally relevant. Mm -hmm. And this is very much the convergence and building. And then the composting, should it be together or should it be independent and many subgroups? Because maybe that's a stage that would benefit from the independence. And you want like, you know, you want the uh, divergent thinking to apply at the research stage and before you come back for another convergent stage mm -hmm. uh, and, and weaving things together. And I think you need both in uh, and I think, pulsating. I think and I think that that's uh, like polarity management, kind of like you were referring to a moment ago. I think that's a polarity to manage. Is like, are we diverging or are we converging? What do we want yeah. to do? How complete do we need to make this? Who wants to take on this small sub piece and play it out? Because it could be that it could be that in the middle of, of such a conversation, one person's like, I love this topic. I'll be back in a week with something that I've created around it. And then that becomes a, an interesting contribution in the, the flow of thought, right? Yep, 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 yep. Um, yeah, so, so I think all that, and I think that um, active engagement together over the topic is essential to this composting or whatever we call it. And we need a we need a great verb that actually sort of calls this out because composting is like rotting, unfortunately, but composting or mulching is also like the generation of nutrients from waste. It's the it's the you know. Uh, and, 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 and certainly the ants in the hive are not busy composting the leaf matter, 
<clears throat> but they sort of are. It's almost an act of mulching. It's, it's like, you know, they're mixing their spit with the leaves and they're putting it on a fungus so that the fungus can, can uh, break down the materials and feed them. So, so composting is awfully close to what's going on, right? And, the, and we call them farmer ants as well. They're not just leaf cutter ants, they're also known as farmer ants because they're farming the fungus. There's a whole other breed of farmer ants that, feed, that farm aphids. You know about those? Yep. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. they basically drink the aphid poop. Uh, <laughs> you know what? There's different forms of making a living in nature and some of them are stranger than others. The, 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 the ants are fascinating. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, E.O. Wilson but, found a career. Yeah, but on the other hand, uh, well, what was the classic Heinlein quote? Specialization is for insects. Uh -huh. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're not, <laughs> we don't want, like, again, and again, I mean, I think specialization, I agree and disagree, specialization can be awfully useful, and, mm -hmm. and generally, and going across specialization is awfully useful, and this is this whole pulsating metaphor, right? Diverge and converge uh you need both exactly and how to kind of how to manage them well together in community is important that is part of what we're trying to model here and invent uh or refine or something like that and then how to do that while preserving uh, a longer term asset is a big piece of it which is why like i just think that like the art internet archive there's a there's a there's a possible like real resonance there with with improving the archive in some way, and yet and yet I think the conversation wasn't like clearly exciting, and and I got a note back from one participant who's an old friend who's like, frankly, I don't see the value, and I was like, well, okay, gosh, interesting. You, you know, it was mentioned again during uh, Mike's. Um, well, Mike mentioned it again in, during his presentation. So Mike, at least, uh, sorry, Mark Carranza sees the value. Okay, good. During his presentation on Saturday, you mean? Yes. Okay, cool. Which um, I missed. Which I'm sorry, I missed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I don't think you know. Some people don't see the value. Or some, some will. It's okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I totally see the value um, because it's the whole question of diversity, right? I'm, of course very, very, very big proponent of diversity and, you know, have diversity and yada, yada, yada. And at one, I remember once almost, you know, waking up in a sweat, not, not exactly, but almost had a nightmare of, okay, we have diversity, we have mixing, and then we lose the diversity because everybody's mixed and we've converged to the mean. Right, right, <laughs> we, right. we do need uh, the ability to like I, I complain about racism and I still do and I still I always will but we need the ability for some people to say no you know what we want to remain heterogeneous in our own little sub community yeah. so <clears throat> and we need that for diversity <laughs> because we don't have these heterogeneous sub packets that right. remain true to whatever weird idea they have <laughs> and I hope it's not ethnic but cultural but whatever right <laughs> it's so, it's yeah so, so is this is this yet another polarity to manage or is this yeah, simply I think an, so. or is this more of an either or thing because so uh, for me i can imagine healthy communities where a piece of their <clears throat> energies are spent figuring out how to collaborate with other people and communicate yeah. with them so that we might govern together <clears throat> over the things that matter to us. Awesome. But to do that, we might need to learn a common language, a lingua franca, uh, a trade language, whatever else it might be. And then also spending a huge amount of our time preserving, protecting, and passing down our traditional cultures and ways. And, Absolutely and, you know, true. Absolutely true. But for, for this traditional culture and ways to be meaningful, you have to have a certain cultural homogeneity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and so you need to be able to say, you know what, let's stick to, let's stick together in this little, and, and I don't think nation state is the right boundary for this. Right, right. Uh, because then you get in trouble. And, yeah. and but, mm -hmm. the, the, and, and the whole question of, you know, who owns the land and, and, and thinking beyond land ownership and yada, yada, yada. It's like, hello, <laughs> people yeah. are worried about the migration flux now. Wait a bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and a, a dear friend of mine just wrote a book about land use over the years. <clears throat> Her name is Joe Gouldy. Uh, and he just, she just wrote, where's the book? Where's the book? Uh, nope, that's not the book. 
where's come on it's brand new <clears throat> uh Well, shoot, I'm on her. I've, I see the history, history manifesto, Roads to Power, and her newest book is, I just added it. That's weird. I'll, I'll let me Google for it. Um, but, but, but you see what I'm saying? Like, for example, yeah. intentional communities. Intentional communities are often heterogeneous in some ways because mm -hmm. whoever picks up on the weird idea behind the intention and there's mm -hmm. diversity there. But well, on the other hand, it's like, yeah. okay, we'll make a com community of people who agree with those tenets or beliefs, or we want to do things this way. Mm -hmm. and that's important. The, the possibility of doing that is profoundly important. Um, I found the book, The Long Land War, The Global Struggle for Occupancy Rights. <clears throat> and it's mm. not, not officially out yet, but it's like in, in, you know, in process. And she's long been like we're concerned about land rights because it's such an important issue in history, right? Um, between enclosure movements and uh, struggles. I, I grew up partly in Peru and I remember Reforma Agraria, agrarian reform was like what, what the opposing candidates always ran on. And occasionally they would win and they would sort of resort the land out to peasants and then occasionally it would get taken away. And that was, that was like this, this con continuous flip-flop battle, you know, the seesaw battle over time uh, my wife's uh, my wife's first novel is about that oh no kidding. land rights in, Af in an imaginary african country <laughs> wow wow that's cool it's... um <clears throat> huh so okay so there's something promising here between us and in the work we're doing together um i'm i'm trying to figure out I'm trying to find the right framing, right invite, the right language, the right motivation for it so that it turns into a happy practice that a bunch of us do, right? And we can do it asynchronously or together. I think that together is really fun because, because it, gets, it gets excited and, and, and it warms up really nicely when somebody says, yes, yes, that, but also, did you know that Margaret Mead did this other thing? And, and, and then it builds a body of evidence that, that each of us kind of brings together to the table. We create a better, a, be, a better and bigger idea of whatever topic we were chewing on at the time. There's an, amp, there's an amplification, there's a, there's a growing and a weaving, a, a connecting, and, but then improving of the thoughts. And this is why I think the GitHub metaphor is so important, right? Because it's about, let's have a little team making a branch and doing a deep dive on a branch from whatever we started from, and then let's weave it back together, like merge back. Okay, we've done this deep dive here, and another team is done another deep dive there, another team is done right. another deep dive there. How, what can we make out of this? But, but the whole fork and branch and we, you know, weave out, weave in metaphor, I think is hugely, hugely important. Yeah. Um, who else is doing this? That that as a community in some sense that we can learn from. Because I don't think I don't I don't think we're unique here. And 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 you know, no. what we're doing is kind of the work of creating the Oxford English Dictionary, except that was just the dictionary. That it wasn't supposed to have opinion in it. It was supposed to just find the first origins of words, really good definitions of words, and then compile that sucker into a big tome. And, and the professor and the madman is entertaining. What? And it was just two humans who were obsessive collaborating. I, I will note, <clears throat> I, I started talking about Oxford OED as a kind of a joke in, in the context. And then I'm realizing it was really created by two people who were completely consumed by the task, one of whom was in an insane asylum. Okay, that's maybe that's the Maybe that's the role model here. Stacy, make a note for the team. <laughs> we should go query some asylums. Uh, but there's other communities of, of collective intelligence, uh, you know, yeah, it, it, it would be interesting for us in OGM to just sort of do a little mental survey of who else do we know that's doing this kind, this nature of work in what way. Scientific communities coming up with papers are digesting, you know, their matter in, in, in a, this way in a scientifically tested rigorous kind of process, right? Um, anybody doing a PhD is doing this by themselves, not so much in community. They're doing a literature, literature search, they're tearing up with a thesis, they're kind of uh, turning that all into something, you know, that they're contributing to their field. 
the, the, but what I hear here is again the um, little team doing something, and of course they're doing it a bit more obsess obsessively. And this is how you get stuff done up to a point. Yeah, uh, and I'm all for it. But it's again some small team doing something. The, 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 what interests me is how the back and forth, the weave in in and out, and that I don't think exists that much because, frankly, the tooling is not there yet. We don't have good tooling to weave back together uh, knowledge graphs, and for me, that's that's my mission, right? <laughs> it's exactly, and it's striking me that the artifacts humans do have is cave paintings that we go back to, and we're, then we stand there and go. Gosh, we have no idea what they were thinking when they did this, or how on earth they painted such beautiful bison way deep in a cave when all they had was torches, or or or, or, or is this a sacred? Is this a sacred painting? Is this just like some somebody who was like, I can paint this? Look, you know, uh, we have very little context, and we go back to those because those are those artifacts have somehow miraculously. I look at those pigments on the wall and I'm like, how is that still on a wall any place after, you know, in some cases, 30,000 years? Yeah. You know, the oldest cave art is, is, is clocking back to that kind of, that kind of timing. It's kind of insane. No, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so it's kind of weird. I'm still here. I'm just going to mute my video for a second. Um, Yeah, uh, there we go. Um, and so who, yeah, so so um, where else do we look? Who else do we ping? Who else is concerned about this? Who else cares? Uh, that kind of thing. I don't know what to say. Uh, the, 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 a lot of people on the one hand, right? It's, it's, it's all over the place. I mean, we yeah. know a lot of, Maybe mapping communities, and this is what Vincent is doing with Throw, is a big, a good first step. Like, as I said, I know people in France doing it. Uh, I've named them a few times. Uh, mm -hmm. I know people, in, and again, there's many people, many communities. And there's community asset mapping, actually, as a practice that has a yeah. couple of different names. And, and like Christina Bowen has used Kumu to do uh, food web mapping of the Columbia River Gorge area, including what organizations are doing what where, what does nature kind of do, some of that. But again, that was a lot of her project because the tool is arcane, right? And so in a really good project, what happens is the tool artist sits in community, listening and feeding back into the tool, into the map, what the community is, 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 is thinking and doing and learning, and the map gets better because one person really knows how to use the tool and the tools are too arcane for a bunch of people to just be weaving in there together usually. And then, and then kind of along the same line of logic, and then this, this, this better map, which is really pretty interesting, is trapped inside of Kumu, which is uh, this complex tool. And that data doesn't make its way out into other mapping, other efforts, other whatever. And at some point is lost when, Christina dies or or you know when the community just decides they don't care about it anymore and don't maintain it or somebody forgets the password to the server or whatever right and and Only then we above, have but yeah and then we have a loss um and, and so and so we have there's a bunch of tools problems here um there's like the better tools are kind of arcane uh the better tools don't leave data that's more useful with other tools in a, in the broader scheme etc and and there seems like I like Creative Commons, the you know CC, the, the organization, and I love the archive, but it feels like we're not actually yet building this more connected commons of information. And, and, and this is why your point about, my goodness, it, the internet archive needs to have this, needs to curate these knowledge graphs, and yeah. that should be part of the curation because the knowledge graphs are, in, have enormous value. On the other hand, you speak about the arcane tools, and that's one thing. But I mean, these tools are going to be complex and arcane. I don't think that's the problem. Yeah. The, the, the problem is that those tools are also immensely idiosyncratic. Yeah. Uh, and how much can I get from having access to your brain and vice versa? Like, the, it's, 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 it's a 
something that helps you think, how much does it help me think? Uh, it'll show me stuff, but I mean, discovering it there or discovering it elsewhere was the difference. What's the, what's the difference is, as I said about um, curated views, right. you can tell a story from this because you've externalized part of the stories you know around this right. into mm. the visual arrangements. Yes. And can I tell a story from your brain? Not clear. I, and, 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 go ahead. No, and it's 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 always and, and the question of negotiate making a personal liminal object, a personal outboard brain into a community liminal object is going to be enormous, a very complex process. And I don't think we have that much good experience of that. Like I'm really curious how many um, ontologies uh, are designed by a very, very small committee versus taking community in, uh, in, input. But the good news is that often a small group does great work and other people are like that. Thank you so much. That's a great contribution. And it gets accepted exactly. and it flows in. So that, that's actually not terrible. The fact that, that, the fact that a terrible. few people working well, a few people collaborating very well can create really useful artifacts is a fine and dandy element True. of this. Um, one, one piece that I'm coming to, and this I think the Friday call brought this home to me, is I think I need to slow things down uh, in, in a sense of, I'm like, okay, good. We're going to have a podcast. We're going to have episodes. And then we're going to have these composting calls. Come on, everybody, let's compost. And it's like, we don't really, really? know what that is. We, we, uh, we need to kind of slow it down to just figure our way to, to poke and test our way into uh, what composting is. And, and like the hoedown call that we did, God, a year and a half ago now, uh, was a really nice call. And I should have done more of them just so that we had a rhythm of, hey, today we're going to test a bunch of tools. And, and one thing I could do is I could change the rhythm of the Thursday calls. And right now we're doing check-in and one topic. We could do check-in topic and hoedown. Or on the topic calls, we could say, hey, it's topic and hoedown and invite people to map and contribute their maps at the end of the call. Or alternate, you know, two topic calls, one hoedown call or whatever. Rhythm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and one fear is that the hoedown-y part of it, the tools part of it will distract from really good topical conversations. <clears throat> and I can see that happening. But if a couple people, if, if a couple Change of manic, rhythm, yeah. if a couple of manic, obsess oops, manic obsessives like me are busy, like composting away during a call and still managing to participate, who, who, that doesn't bother anybody else really. And, and I think the artifacts are better, but I have this feeling I need to slow down the pace to find our way to what this is. And then well, I, I'm not coming to the Thursdays because between the Monday and Tuesday, where personally I get more value. Yeah. It's not, I'm not saying there's no value on Thursday. It's like I had to make a choice. I, I, I totally understand. And I am just so thrilled that you're you're with us regularly on Mondays and Tuesdays. Like, like thank you. Um, because I love how your brain works and what you bring, what you bring to every conversation. Um, you just reminded me of something that showed up in my head a moment ago that I forgot, which is it might be useful for me to run a poll about my brain. <clears throat> And basically, because because I have personal experience and firsthand, almost like testimonial emails from friends who are like, Jerry, I've made it a practice when I hit some new area to go look in your brain because I always find useful links and I don't know. And other people who are like, who, who can who can look at what's, what, I, what I've mapped and how I've mapped it and they get stuff from it. And then I have plenty of evidence from others <clears throat> who are like, I look at your map and without you guiding me, Without you saying, hey, this goes here, this goes there, this is why, I'm lost. It's just, a, it's just a mess of links, right? And then there's other people who are like, I don't get any of it. And, and, I, don't, and I don't know what distinguishes one from the other. I don't know what might bump some people from one group into a, a, a group that sees more value and gets more value without my participation. I don't know how to increase my presence without increasing my presence literally with ours, right? So, so I have a couple of use case videos that I shot a year or more ago <clears throat> about how to use the brain. One is about the potato, uh, you know, a couple others. And they're, they're fine and dandy tours through a, a slice of the brain saying, hey, here's a bunch of really interesting things about the damn potato. The potato is this fascinating, fascinating, uh, you know, uh, starting point. Food, yeah, I can see food it. source. It's like you know, <clears throat> born born in in, <clears throat> in the Andes with uh, in Bolivia and Peru makes its way to Europe where nobody will eat it. 
royalty has to trick and convince people to eat it. By the time they get everybody eating it, the blight shows up and wipes out the potato crop and causes famine. And then that's just one little slice of the story. And you're like, oh my God, right? And, and part of the reason there's a blight is that there's 400 varieties of potato in Peru and only two of them get brought to Europe. So there's a monocrop, it's a clone crop, which is completely vulnerable to the blight. And, and you're like, so as, many interesting things here. As, and, as, as, mono, as monocultures generally are, and as we see right now with humans. Bingo. And with, with factory farming and monocropping and all that kind of stuff. And, and then it spills over into the Irish potato famine and this huge immigration of, of Irish into America, where they are mistreated and hated. Like, like, like the latest wave of immigrants is always spat on, stomped on, frowned on, hated, all of that. Like, like people hate the Irish, like, like can't stand them. Um, like they hate the Poles and like they hate Italians and like, you know, as each wave and the, as each wave shows up. Um, so anyway, I, I love all those connections and I love mixing and matching stories about those things with an awareness that off, sometimes they're just stories. Sometimes they're just, you know, sometimes they're not actually supported by evidence. But, but, but you're saying, you're, you see what I'm saying about, like, this is really at the, back to the curated view thing. Yeah. You told me a story. That story is present in the links, as in all the links that make up the story are there. But the story isn't, because the story is more than that. It's a path and a narrative, and taking a subset of the path to right. uh, make a certain causal relationship or set of causal relationships evident in the whole path. And that's what I was calling a curated view. So go ahead. And and. and, and I can see how people who are, uh, and I'm, I'd really get, uh, you're, you're right, the, the survey would be interesting, how much of being able to derive value from your brain has to do with enough context to be able to, so that the new links enrich existing context. Because I found, like, uh, I'm one of my claims to fame is I learn fast. And, 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 and when, People ask me, how do you do it? It's well, it's because a lot of things, there's a framework. So a new fact gets grafted onto an existing framework. And I know where it fits because it's got a framework to attach to. It's not floating in midair, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you, your brain is naturally sort of ontological, taxonomical, and logical. Yeah. And then yeah. the, the reason this, that your life quest is to create this info loom and to figure out how arguments work is that you have really rich frameworks going on in your head. And when something new floats by, you're like, oh good, it's like this and this and. Yeah, it, it, it's my, it's the way my brain works. And I have absolutely rotten visual memory, for example. And you know, it's brains are different, <laughs> whatever. That's not the point. The point is not about me. The point is, is it, it, are people who relate to your brain, is it because they have more of kind of visual thinking or, uh, receptivity to serendipity and to seeing value in new stuff? Or is it that they have enough existing frameworks that the new links fit well with existing links? Total, I'm, I'm, I'm mouthing are, hypothesis and I'm sure there's yeah. more. <laughs> These are great questions. So I, I'm, I'm actually really inspired to set up a poll and maybe, maybe set up to use one of our calls um, to design a good, a, a nice poll, send it out to as many people as possible, and, and to then sit down together and analyze results and sort of slow things down and go deeper in, into that. Um, and also, I think sometimes, I think the people who get more value are the people who stop and just nose around longer to the point where they, to the point where they begin to pick up the patterns that I'm busy doing ongoing. Right, it makes perfect sense. Because I have a bunch of cliches. I have a bunch of ways. There's a style that I use when I'm feeding my brain. There's and, a pattern. And, yep, yep. And yep, once yep, you yep. once you've sort of sort of nosed around in there enough, and you start to absorb my pattern, I think then stuff starts to call out. And if you don't know that I use purple for opinions and yellow for look here, which is something I try to explain in the you know brain 101 video kind of thing. But if you miss the brain 101 video and you're just in there kind of poking in the dark, it's going to be harder. Right, 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 right. The, 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 and no, it, it would be interesting to have this survey actually. But what I was trying to say is your, the story is implicit in your brain. It's not stated. And it's a very big part of the knowledge encoded in your brain. Yes. 
and, and making that explicit. Like I remember the first thing you wanted with Meme Brain was, oh, can I have a path representation? Because your stories are paths. They're not right. links. They're not their paths. Right. They're, they're, they're higher they're, level patterns. They're links of links. On, they're links of links. Yeah. So, <laughs> fancy that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Exactly. And one of the reasons I really liked Prezi before they killed themselves uh, was that ability to declare a path, right? And I, I was trying to figure out how to make the brain do something Prezi-like, you know, yep, yep, uh, just, yep, yep, yep. just like programmatically, because Miro is quite programmatic. It would be cool if somebody wrote some code uh, to, to help Miro be Prezi. <clears throat> that would be, I hear you. that's got to be doable. Of course. That's got to be doable. Anyway, no, I, I think I think this is this. I don't know if we got a conclusion, but I really think that this whole question of what is the narrative behind the that is encoded in the curation in the curated view, that's fu fu one fundamental question, versus the value of the graph itself. Like the val the value of the graph is really what story is it telling. Or what simplification is it affording, right? Uh, and ontologies, they're not telling a story, but they're giving people bins in which to put things. And that's also <clears throat> of value. And of right. course, it can be also limiting. We, are, we know that, but that's okay. I mean, that's the point is we are creating, uh, and, and I insist so much on, yeah, what's the use of ontology without the distinguishing characteristic of why this is different from that? Because again, mm -hmm. the distinguishing characteristic is another part of the story that right. may be missing if all you have is the skeleton of the ontology, right? <laughs> Say that again? Um, the distinguishing yeah. characteristic is a, a, a big part of the real ontology as opposed to just the skeleton of the yeah. Right. Yeah. It's not it's not just the taxonomy. It's like, OK, what makes this part of the taxonomy different from its siblings? And uh, I think we're all earnestly trying to figure out how to distill those insights so yep. that they are crisp and visible and useful. Exactly. Right. We, we want yep. them to just jump out so that you can be like, oh, I'm so glad somebody boiled it down to that, which yep. is part, which is partly why we love pattern languages is that pattern languages are a community. Distillation, community, yep, 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 community. yep. So, so sorry, neither of us thought of the pattern language movement when I asked earlier, so who the hell is doing collective intelligence? And gotta say, any group of people who's made any progress on a pattern language fit, fits that bill really nicely. And we live right close to a couple of communities that have done a whole bunch of that, right? But again, question, are the pattern language usually, uh, are, are they done by communities or by, you know, loan scholars? And it, the, the answer is probably both. Yeah, yeah, the answer is probably both. I, th I think what winds up happening in a good pattern language is that one or two people are the guides of the whole pattern language that then several participants took particular interest in several uh, patterns and nodes and wove them in and that, and that the group of them had some really interesting and possibly difficult conversations about the broad scheme and how things fit and whether this is or isn't a pattern and how to break this one up and whatever. And that those were hopefully, if, I mean, if the thing was really fruitful, that those were exciting conversations because people could see commonalities and they could see that wisdom was being distilled and all of that. So, you know, whether it's Christopher Alexander and his team at University of Oregon back in the seven, late seventies, probably early eighties, you know, writing the first one <clears throat> or whoever. Um, but I, th but I think there's a really interesting excursion here into pattern language communities. And we have several people who would love to write pattern languages. And so we may be back in that. And we, should, we might have to have the, the tools conversation again about, about what is our best bet? You know, is it Massive Wiki? Do we use Markdown and Massive to do a pattern language? I don't know. Yep. OK, I think uh, on that note, I should go back to building my own tools. <laughs> OK. I think well, this was a good uh, stopping point. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've got lots of good things running in my head and I've got a bunch of links to, to, to go read and absorb and put in my brain, but thank you. Uh, a bientôt. A bientôt. Ciao, ciao. Ciao.